I've got the power supply. <laughs> the power supply? I'm actually going to check something. That's because I'm an idiot. I'm a die. Hello all and welcome to another Retro Crazy. If you can't tell, we're looking at the Atari 800XL. Now I've restored an Atari 400 previously and like that model, the Atari 800 was launched in 1979 as well. It featured dual cartridge ports, four joystick ports and an easy upgrade path to a whopping 48K. These were no cheap systems though. If you've ever seen or lifted a 400 800, they are hefty beasts indeed. I mean, we're talking around 10 pounds or four and a half kilos. However, in 1983, to compete with the cheaper and more prevalent systems now available, think things like Commodore 64, the TI-99 4A, and here in the UK, the ZX Spectrum, the 800XL was released along with the 600 and 1200XL. These were completely redesigned, had one cartridge port, two joystick ports, and a new 6502B CPU, simply called Sally. I bought this towards the end of 2023 off of eBay from a lovely eBay seller. It was supposed to be collection only from London, however, after it didn't sell, I messaged them and uh, they agreed that I could arrange a courier collection and they'd box it up. It's now here on the blue mat, so let's have a look at this 80s machine. On the right hand side we have the two joystick ports, on the back we have our uh, peripheral port, we've got our parallel bus which is covered by a protective plate, we've got monitor output, we've got our switch box which is the RF output, we've got power in and an on off rocker switch. There's nothing on the opposite side and on the underside we can clearly see one, two, three, four, five, six screws. Now this still has a fair bit of weight and I can see in here this line that you can see that looks like a massive heat sink and it's got a fair chunk of weight to it. If it's not a heat sink it's a big lump of something. Now this one does need a good clean, it's quite grubby, um, yeah, kind of looks like an odd fingerprint. Nicely though, the protective film is still over the cartridge port doors, and they're nice and free, and like the earlier machines, they still have the buttons at the side. I need to check, but I may be missing the, uh, the nice piece of decorative brushed metal that sits here, unfortunately. Maybe I can pick up a damaged machine that's beyond repair or just an upper case or something and see if we can get that piece. Keyboard itself, it's actually quite nice. Not too bad at all. So let's crack this open and let's see what's inside. So with the top shield off, we can see we've got a free gift of uh, a little uh, Christmas cracker type toy where you've got to try and get both of the, uh, the rings over the centre. Lovely. Somebody's had a kid who's shoved it through the cartridge port. <laughs> Glad that's all they shoved in. It was a large membrane for the keyboard. It came off nice and cleanly. It still looks fine and intact. And we can see a rather large shield. Now it doesn't look like there are many screws holding this down. I've got one, two, and I don't see any others. So it looks like what they've done, like the 
Atari 2600 that I've looked at before is everything sandwiched between these two shields so one on the bottom one on the top so let's pop these off and delve in a bit further so that's quite a tight fit so you've got to have the switch in this position which is the on position you can lift this guide it out you've then got to try and lift everything move it slightly towards uh, the the front so you can then get this out everything yeah it's it's a, a, a wiggle fit I think is a polite phrase okay there's still screws to go let's check the underside yep many screws to go so let's get all these screws out And there we have it, we are in. Even though this is meant to be a cost reduced version, these are quite thick and rigid, uh, including the base. So yeah, very, very impressive. We can see there is discoloration and that looks to be around where the cartridge port's been. Hopefully that'll just clean off. But as normal, I can see a whole bunch of capacitors everywhere which I'm going to be replacing. Now I have been asked numerous times why do I automatically replace capacitors? It's quite simple. 1983 roughly, in fact we can check, uh, 26 month of 83, 83, uh, 84, 84, 83, so even if this, the newest chips are 84, so even if this was made in 84, we are talking about 40 years old. And all of these caps have what's known as a wet electrolyte. That will evaporate, it will dry out, and even though currently the capacitors may in fact be absolutely fine, that does not mean to say that in a year, two years, three years, they're still going to be fine. So if I replace them now with known good quality capacitors, I'm hoping we get another 40 years before they need to be replaced. So that's why I do it, no other reason. So let me crack on and we will start ripping these caps off and replacing them. So that's the board all recapped. I've had to use some slightly higher voltage caps than I would normally do by a considerable bit. These are meant to be 22 UF 16 volts and I've had to use 63 volt versions because I just could not get any in a reasonable time frame, which is a bit annoying, but such is life. However, they all fit in. I've got none touching anything, so they do all shoehorn in. Point to note, these are what they call non-polarised or bipolar caps. So make sure if you're doing your own, you get the right ones. And nice to see, and I should have pointed this out earlier, all the main chips are socketed. Right, let's pop this to the side and continue. Now the keyboard itself was in reasonable condition, but I certainly want to make sure I clean the plastics up. So I need to make all of these screws disappear. Alright, well that's that apart. It was not fun because guess what Atari do? They glue the sides down, even though there's screws at the side to hold everything in place, they glued both sides. I'm not quite sure why. However, it's apart, it did not break. So now 
I can put this with the bottom of the case and we can get these away and get them a good wash. Now this again will be done in warm soapy water with some soap and vanish oxy action which will help lift off a lot of the marks and improve this no end. So as for the keyboard, other than some bits of random plastic, it's not too bad. So I'm just going to give this a clean and then pop this to the side. We'll give the tops of the, the metal keycaps a clean as well. And that should be that for the keyboard, assuming the membrane has survived the test of time. And with the keyboard given a good basic clean, let's pop it to the side and move on. Now I normally start with a power supply, however, this is a potted sealed unit and it's heavy. There's quite a bit of weight to this and that tells me that this is just full of potting compound. So there's not going to be a lot I can do with this. There are some safety checks I can do. I can make sure that the output voltages are correct here. But first, I've noted that this plug is quite new and it's rated 13 amps. These don't draw anywhere near enough to warrant a 13 amp fuse. So I'm going to open this, double check, see what's in it, and if need be, swap it out. And here in the UK, that's a 13 amp. If this was drawing 13 amps, uh, this would be melting. So just checking the cables not too bad. It's not the sheet, the outer is not right up to the pin but close enough and that one is fully covered so that's fine. Make sure these are even means even pressure. That's fine. I always check see see how loose that is. If I just left that there over time that can actually potentially fall out and yeah you don't want a loose, loose piece of metal rattling inside a plug that can take 240 volts. That's just bad. So let me grab a fuse and let's swap this out. So here in the UK for something as small as this we're going to be using a 3 amp fuse. Typical values in the UK 3, 5 and 13 amps and with that in place I am feeling much happier about closing this up before I plug it in to test it. And the 13 amp, well, let's just say I've pulled a few out. That's, uh, yeah, that's how bad people are at using the wrong fuses. So with the plug all checked, let's power on and find out what we're getting. So first off, good sign. No explosion and the way the plugs on these are done this here in the middle that is effectively connected to the shield and then one side is positive the other side's negative simple as so let's see what we get when we do a test and we're getting five volts a nice steady five volts lovely so we can now pop this to the side so now I've got a whole pile of parts. Let's turn this into something resembling an Atari 800XL.
and there we go we have an Atari 800XL that's now back together and looking like an Atari 800XL now I know this looks very scratched up but please remember it's still got the original protective film on it it's the film that's scratched I am not going to be peeling that off I do not want that to deteriorate that's actually quite nice as it is however this is annoying me <laughs> this piece of trim is in the wrong place um, keyboard might be slightly offset as well not sure no it looks okay it's, it's these keys <laughs> yeah being offset to the right is kind of annoying but that gap at the top can be partially sorted with that if that was straight but yeah missing a piece here all right next would normally be testing but not this time so here's the Atari 1010 tape deck with its power supply and again the power supply is a sealed unit so no real way into this I'll give the case a clean we'll check its uh, output make sure everything's fine but there's not really a lot we can do with that however the tape deck itself is particularly grubby and it's got something falling about inside so that needs to come out so let's get this apart so there we are that's it apart that was rather awkward there are two tabs at the top there's at least two at the bottom these ones are obviously broken that one's got a fresh mark or at least a white mark where it's been stressed there's nothing on that side nothing on that side that one's been stressed so I don't know if they're just little sideways hook tabs if so that's a very weak design but probably not because it does feel sharp not to worry let's get this out number of screws on the bottom because there are a number of caps I want to replace these look okay but that one looks a little bit bent so I may see about straightening that a fraction we'll clean it with some deoxit the belt itself kind of looks okay but it's difficult to tell just by looks we've got a, another belt here for I'm gonna guess that's the tape counter I do have a belt but it's for the 410 so probably no good for this but let's get the rest of this stripped out so we can see what we're working with So with everything apart we can get down to the nitty gritty of recapping and cleaning now I just want to point out typical Atari brass inserts pushed into the plastic specifically for the screws and what this does it means that the plastics should last for years because you're not you know coarse tapping directly into the plastics so really nice assembly there and another reason why Atari's were more expensive now this was a bit of a kerfuffle to get out and there's still bits of fluff and debris coming out however it's out I can get to everything to give it a good clean clean up all the, the buttons clean up the chassis give the idler wheels a good clean fingers crossed that'll all be fine everything else seems to be okay it seems to be doing what it's supposed to it's just those belts so let's strip this down and let's recap this and then reassemble into its nice clean case obviously assuming I've managed to clean it and we'll take it from there So that's this board completely recapped I do want to say that you'll notice I used audio caps here 
I don't know if it's a manufacturer's brand, but these ones actually have Audia written on them. So I'm going to assume they're audio caps. So I ordered these up specially from my usual seller, which is Techie Kid on eBay. Go check him out. He is absolutely superb. And he was able to provide me with a good selection of the caps I need. Interestingly, thank you very much, Martin. Try these on me. So these are an upgrade to the caps I'd ordered and he supplied me a couple to try. So I have popped them in. So with this board now all done and all soldered, I'll give it a quick clean and we can look at that tape unit. So here we are at the actual main mechanism. Let's give this a quick clean. One of the belts is fairly easy to remove and that's the one for the tape counter. So we can just drop that off and you can see just how bad it is. It's actually retaining the shape. So yeah, that's, that's not good. I'll put it over a blue area. You can see it's retaining, not great. So for the bin, as they say, let's give this a quick clean and then replace this belt and then the actual motor belt. Okay, we've hit a stumbling block. These are not flat. These are definitely square uh, profile belts. This is for the 1010 and it's the square belt Hong Kong model, which it, it is. And that's not right. There's no tension in that at all. You can see it moving it. I mean, that should be under tension. Yeah, something's not right. Well, there we are, that's the mechanism done. Luckily, my uh, cheap China set of bands had one that was close, so that should be fine. And again, if we do that now, you see there's no funny shape going past. Excellent. So, unfortunate about this, don't know what's going on. I'll, uh, I'll let DataServe know in case they've maybe got a band patch. Very strange. So that's it all back together. It's all nice and solid. Looks nice, looks clean. So what does that leave us to do? I've got the power supply for this to check and then it's on to testing the 800XL, hopefully without blowing it up. So here we are with the power supply for the tape deck. It's listed as eight and a half volts. It's again a sealed unit. So unless I want to go breaking this apart, which doesn't feel like it's potted and the sides do flex but I'm not hearing the good old telltale creaking and cracking that uh, any super glue is breaking it will need a good dust because it is filthy so here we are ready for testing it's all plugged in ready it is an AC output so let's find out what we get little bit higher than the 8.5 volts it recommends that it's going to give out but that's not under load yet so it's probably about right yep very happy with that great so let's move on to the scary bit well here we are at the scary bit the bit I absolutely detest but hey gotta be done so let's get the telly on 
and let's power on at the wall. So we've got the main power brick which is just off the side here. That's now running which means the Atari should power on. However, what I want to do is I'm going to power this on, check the keyboard. I'm going to try and load something but using the SVI CAS because that's a known loading system. And then at that point, if everything's running, we'll try the 1010. Okay, so source is going to be side AV. And with that done, let's find out what happens when I try and power on the Atari. Got a red LED on the front. Are we running? Oh, we're running. Yay, okay, right, keyboard test. <laughs> Excellent, right, okay, reset, works, <laughs> oh, happy, happy, I don't know what some of these do, mm. okay, let's power it off, and let's plug in the SVI CAS, okay, so SVI CAS is on, still on the last system I worked on, so let's change that to the Atari, and I actually forgot that this has a built-in test. So, if we do that first. Okay, so if we reset here, I'm going to select Chucky Egg, and if I remember, I think it's power off, start, and that should be it. Oh, there we go. Hey, success! We have Chucky Egg. Uh, okay, and unfortunately it looks like... <laughs> Joystick only! No! No! <laughs> I didn't think to plug a joystick in. Okay, it shows that it's running. Superb. So next, let's switch all this off. Swap over to the 1010 and see if it still works. Yes, excellent, okay. And here's the danger of using very old media. Boot error straight away. So I fast forwarded and flipped over to the second side. Let's try again. And no, nope, we've got a boot error again. So either this tape's dead or my tape deck's not working. Now I do have a batch of these. They are all untested. I do not know if any of these work. So we'll just move on to the next one. Now before using a tape that hasn't been used for a while, it's a good idea to fast forward and rewind a few times just to set the tension on the tape. Right, let's try Dawn Raider. Oh dear, another boot error. This is not looking good. Next, we'll try Frenesis. Okay, this is not looking good for the Atari 1010. Okay, 
these all came in in a batch that I got in because I'll be honest I could not find my own tapes down in my storage unit but three in a row mm, unless somebody's selling me dodgy tapes not. next to try is gun law nope Next, we'll try Hover Bover. Nope, another boot error. Well, this is it. This is the last tape. It's quite a long tape. So, this will either work or it won't. And this is Leapster, <laughs> if we get to see it. Nope. And I have to say that tape I can hear it and that sounds fine, but that's just to my aging ears, so who knows. Well, that is so sad that we have to end on a low, but that's six different tapes I've been through and that's my entire stock here at the moment, unfortunately. However, we have a fully working Atari 800XL, we've proved that at this moment in time. These may or may not be working, I don't know. I need another known working 1010 to test and confirm. So at this moment in time, this, uh, yeah, may or may not work, I don't know. However, thank you for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next Retro Crazy or Retro Crazy Minibite.